contract. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. There's finally got finally got hold of him. This is the third hit I had. I finally got him. I lost the other two on the subwalk. Paula subwalk. I've hardly ever fished this lure. I've had it for a couple years, but it's a striking image of a mullet. It doesn't have a bill on it, so it doesn't dive, but it sinks a little bit. Oh, I am not getting stuck on grass. Hey, I love this bait. I'm getting at two or three hits per cast. Nice oh, trout, man. too. Well, I tell you, they are right off that oh, path. All over. <laughs> Doubled up here. Yeah. Back us off again. Yeah, pulling motor. This has been probably the most productive jerkbait bite I've ever been sustained jerkbait bite I've ever been on. And suddenly, there was no more action at the top of the water column. Oh. Oh, it's gone. Switch to quarter ounce jig, green hornet on it, and immediately got two strikes. Oh, 16. Wow, he swallowed it down too. As usual, today we were confronted with another mystery. Why did the red hot bite that was happening high in the water column stop, but the trout were still there and feeding when the bait was on the bottom? And just for clarification, undersized trout could still be caught at the surface but not the larger fish, which the reason for that is an entire subject on its own and I don't want to explore that now. Today, like almost always, the trout were unobservable to us, so our analysis was limited to a few observable items. Number one, lighting. Since this was the first thing in the morning, the sun was rising up there somewhere, but above a thick blanket of clouds, so there wasn't much increase in light intensity. And so this doesn't seem like a strong contributor. Number two, water clarity. It was clear and not changing. Number three, water temperature. No change there. It was staying around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Number four, bait. No bait on the surface visible, but these birds are looking for some. They know something's going on. I guess they can see so far into the water this morning. There wasn't any surface signs of bait before or after the bite change. There were some gulls flying around looking into the clear water, but not diving. So I can't say what the bait was doing. Number five, water flow. There was an observable change in this condition. When we started, there was only a slight movement of the water, but by the time the bite changed, the water flow was obvious at the rocky point near where we were catching. Yeah, so now our point has some water flow around it, <clears throat> so the tide's starting to push out water. But I wouldn't call the flow rate strong 
For instance, we weren't fighting the current with the trolling motor, so surely a healthy speckled trout could easily maneuver through this level of current to continue feeding near the surface. To unravel any mystery, you need to dig below what is just obvious. Because, well, if it's obvious, there isn't any mystery. So, I've been studying fish anatomy lately, and that's where I'm going to start digging. And, okay, I know that sounds crazy, but give me a second to explain because there's a lot of interesting and useful things that you can learn from a study of fish anatomy. From a physical science perspective, it seems fundamental that creatures living in a very dense fluid like water will be more restricted by how their anatomy interacts with the environment than creatures living in air. For instance, the shape of a fish's body will define its behavior more so than a land animal. A fish with a wide, short body, like a bass, is less hydrodynamically efficient because that shape has to push more water out of the way to move, whereas a fish with a torpedo-shaped body, like a speckled trout, can move through the water with much less effort. Therefore, we could quickly conclude that the bass is not going to swim long distances, but a speckled trout could, and in fact they do when they swim from the marsh out to the gulf in order to breed and then back. Another revealing characteristic of a fish is its tail. If we look at this bass, we see a full wide tail with lots of surface area. This kind of tail grabs a lot of water with each stroke and is great for accelerating the fish forward very quickly. That fits very well with how a bass behaves. It's a real boogeyman, hiding in the grass or behind a log and bursting out with a huge open mouth to swallow you up. But there's a downside to this high surface area tail. As the speed of the water over the fish increases, this big tail becomes less hydrodynamically efficient when it moves, and that results in an increase in drag. That means that a lot of energy is required to keep the fish moving at top speed. And as we know, fish can't afford to waste energy. So I wouldn't expect a fish with this kind of tail to swim fast for long distances. And just to clarify, swimming fast in calm water is the same as swimming slow in a strong current. Therefore, I also wouldn't expect a fish with this type of tail to spend a lot of time swimming against a strong current. In comparison, Look at the tail of a mullet. It has a noticeable V in the tail, which looks a lot like the tail of some types of salmon. And of course, everybody knows that salmon swim upstream for long distances. To the point, this mullet was snagged from a high current area next to the Murgo Dam. The mullet's tail is lower in surface area, which provides less acceleration per stroke but is more efficient when swimming fast or in strong current. Mullet is one fish we can often observe inshore, and if you think about it, they seem to always be moving. They can also hit some very high speeds when needed. We also see other inshore fish that have low drag tails, such as menhaden, or as we know them in Louisiana, pogies and the ladyfish. These fish will expend less energy swimming at a higher sustained speed or swimming up current than the bass will. So I would expect these fish to be comfortable in current and to be on the move most of the time. So how do you know when the bite on your cork is from a ladyfish and not a trout? It goes sideways instead of going down. That's because ladyfish are zooming around all the time. And why I have lost gear to them. See that? I almost lost that rod. The redfish has a triangular tail, similar to a king salmon, and its tail provides the surface area needed for its characteristic speedy attack. But it doesn't look like an ideal tail for lots of time in current. 
and except for bull reds, most fishermen target them in ponds. So what does the tail of a speckled trout look like? Oh wow, that is not a low drag tail. It's basically diamond shaped and I wouldn't expect a fish with that tail to be comfortable spending a lot of time in strong current. But I would expect it to have a powerful lunge. But we already know to look for feeding trout around areas of moving water. So how do we reconcile the characteristic of the speckled trout's form with its known behaviors? When I draw conclusions from the shape of a trout, I would say that it has a hydrodynamically efficient body shape, suitable for moving in current, and it has a tail capable of accelerating its body very quickly. I could then make assumptions such as a speckled trout won't often expend the high energy needed to swim upstream or remain stationary in strong current, but it could easily lunge into the current to grab prey. Therefore, it may position itself near current, in which fish like mullet and pogies are feeding or hiding. A logical place for the trout would be in an eddy or on the bottom. The thing about the bottom is that, due to drag on the flowing water by the solid bottom, the flow is not nearly as strong at the bottom, as it is just a few feet above. Therefore, if the trout are hanging right on the bottom, it could stay out of the strongest current, but be close enough to move in for a meal. Even better, if there was a drop-off over which the water flowed, the trout could hang at the drop-off. I believe this was demonstrated to us on the same day at another cut entering Lake Bourne. We left fish biting at the first spot to see what was happening at this cut, and like the first spot, we found trout feeding on the bottom, but they were not in the current at the point, but instead along the rocky shoreline in the stiller water, 50 feet from where the current flowed around the point. All right, decent fish too. Oh yeah. We know that at least in the winter, trout spend a lot of time on the bottom. And we know that because we see sores on their bellies. But do they spend much time on the bottom during the rest of the year? Well, let's see if there is anything else in fish anatomy that would provide at least part of that answer. First, is there any specialization in fish that live on the bottom that we could also find in speckled trout? When I think of a bottom fish, the first species that comes to mind is the catfish. One of the most characteristic aspects of catfish are their barbels, which have taste buds on them, and which they use to find food in murky water. Hmm, that's not very helpful here, because speckled trout don't eat food that stays in one place long enough to be tasted. Catfish have skin with no scales, which is a specialization for life on the bottom, because scales can get knocked off when bumping into solid things. Trout do have scales, but they are unusually small scales. And some other definite bottom dwelling fish also have really small scales, like a flounder. And a flounder feels like it has skin, even though it does have scales. And apparently that holds up very well when getting bumped into. So maybe small scales are beneficial for life on the bottom, just like skin. I can't overlook the slime that catfish have, which is a great lubricant to reduce abrasion when scraping along the bottom. It's also a good barrier against parasites that are living in the sediment. I don't get a bunch of slime on my hands when I handle flounder, but they are extremely slippery. So I'd say they also have some very effective lubricant just different than a catfish. And do trout have slime? You bet they do. I can't fish with that stuff on my hands because I'm afraid of losing my pole on the next strike. So right there are two attributes of known bottom dwelling fish that also appear on speckled trout. This doesn't prove that trout spend lots of time on the bottom, but both of these attributes would help trout be safer on the bottom and typically in the natural world, specialized attributes have meaning, and they aren't just flukes. 
That's pretty interesting to me, and it may be a helpful perspective when I'm fishing. If you stuck with me this far, I'll give you a theory about what I think happened with the larger trout that they wouldn't bite on our jerk baits anymore and went to the bottom to feed. When we first arrived, the tide was just starting to fall, which motivated the bite. And then with the low water flow, the larger trout were comfortable attacking upwards, chasing our baits, and just generally having free reign of the water column. But when the tide stopped dropping more rapidly, these same trout determined that their most efficient feeding technique would be staying near the bottom, which is why our jerk baits and twitch baits stopped working. But the quarter ounce jigs with swim baits got us back into the bite. Was the moderate current flow after the change too much for larger trout to feed in? I just don't buy that. You know, they're strong creatures. I think they easily could have come up and fed above. But to understand why they didn't, I think we have to look at the entirety of the conditions that they were dealing with. So these things would include the increase in the water flow, but also the relatively low water temperatures just meant that the meta their metabolism would be slowed a little bit and that would discourage aggressive feeding. And then also the sun never came out. so. You know, I think they could understand that it wasn't going to warm up anytime soon. In the end, I have to assume that the larger trout made a calculation instinctively that said feeding up at the water column is going to take more energy and I'm going to move down and I'm going to feed off of the bottom where I can still catch bait but I'll use less energy. It's going to be more comfortable for me. Well, I hope this discussion made a few neurons in your brain pop, maybe got you thinking a bit more about some of the other aspects of our slimy friends. And let me know uh, how this all compares to your experience and give it a thumbs up, share it if you want, and uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, give me a subscribe. And finally, get out there and get some slime on your hands.